In this week's Parsha of Etchanan, we find one of Judaism's most important and central prayers, the Shema. As Jews, we're commanded to read these words, which affirm our faith and commitment to God and His Torah, every morning and evening, whether we are in the synagogue, at home, or even on the road. Indeed, throughout our history, this prayer has been whispered by young children at bedtime. Its words have been shouted in defiance by thousands and times of religious persecution. And even today, this affirmation is the highlight of the closing service of Yom Kippur, the holiest day on the Jewish calendar. It's interesting, though, that the first few words of the Shema, after we pronounce our faith in the existence of a one God, contain the commandment to love God with all our heart, our soul, and our might. The Torah contains many do's and don'ts that dictate our daily behavior. 613 laws in all that we are instructed to follow. And whether or not one can understand and appreciate the meaning and relevance of the mitzvot, we can nonetheless incorporate them into our day-to-day -day lives to go ahead and simply fulfill them. God asks us to do it, all right, so we'll do it. But is it possible to ask somebody to feel a certain way? To love something or someone that he or she may simply not love? Is it truly reasonable for the Torah to command us to not only obey God, but to actually love Him as well. As a young child, my mother instructed me that I must eat the lima beans on my dinner plate. I had no choice. I had to force those stale, tasteless, sorry-looking legumes down my throat. But never once did she tell me to love those lima beans. That's something that seems to be beyond one's control. You either love it or hate it, and in my case, it was the latter. How then can the Torah command one to have an emotion to love God with one's heart, soul, and with their might? Rabbi Schneir Zalman of Liadi, in his fundamental book of Chabad philosophy, the Tanya, explains that the commandment to love God is in actuality a directive to focus one's mind and intellect to contemplate upon the greatness of the Almighty. The knowledge and comprehension of one's intellect can trickle down and translate into emotion. The power of our mind can give birth, so to speak, to emotions. By studying and comprehending the inherent truths of God's all-pervading reality, that He is the master and creator of all, that He is truly the source of all life, that the entire universe exists only by virtue of His primary existence, by appreciating that God transcends the world and at the same time lowers Himself, so to speak, allowing us to bond with Him, and bestows upon us great kindnesses, both deserved and otherwise, one develops an emotional attachment and longing, and yes, a love for the Almighty. While it's true that one can obey all of God's directives faithfully like a devoted servant, observing the Torah's laws with a simple mental commitment and duty towards God, we can, however, and must endeavor to enrich our relationship with the Almighty by developing an emotional yearning and love for Him. Serving God with genuine feeling is a bit of a longer path. It does take quite a bit of study and effort to develop and cultivate a love for the Almighty. The Tanya calls this the long, shorter way. Yes, it is a longer journey. It is a path that takes a greater investment of time and effort, but when properly pursued, is sustainable and permanent, and will certainly lead man to his ultimate destination. Loving lima beans, though, might be a bit of a long shot. I'm Rabbi Benny Rappaport, and thank you for joining us.